Hello, my name is Shannon Kemp, and I am the Executive Editor of Dataversity. We would like to thank you for joining January's installment of the Data monthly Dataversity webinar series, Enterprise Data World. This webinar series is designed to give our Enterprise Data World conference attendees education year-round, a conference we produce in partnership with DEMA International. Enterprise Data World will be held this year in Austin, Texas, April 27th through May 4th, 2014. And today's webinar is a preview of one of those talks that you can experience at the event, Information Management Principles with John Ladley. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A in the bottom hand, right hand corner of your screen or via Twitter. Uh, Hashtag EDW14. As always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of this session, and additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now let me introduce to you our speaker for today, John Ladley. John is a business technology thought leader with 30 years experience in planning, project management, and pro improving IT organizations and successful implementation of information systems. John is a recognized authority in the use and implementation of business intelligence and enterprise information management. He is the author of Making EIM Work for Business, A Guide to Managing Information as an Asset, and Data Governance, How to Deploy and Sustain a Data Governance both, uh, Program. Both books you can find on the Dataversity Bookstore, and I'll be sure and get you links for that. He frequently writes and speaks on a variety of technology and enterprise information management topics. His information management experience is balanced between strategic technology planning, project management, and practical application of technology to business problems. We are very lucky to have him here with us today, and with that, I will give the floor to John. Hello and welcome. Thank you very much, Shannon, and good uh, morning, afternoon, evening to everybody, wherever you may be. Thank you so much uh, for your time and uh, at this moment. Let's get uh, into the uh, topic here. Shannon, I assume I've got control now? You do. Yes, so there we go. I am under control. I hardly ever get to say that. Um, here is uh, me, and we've heard all of that. Um, there's pictures of the aforementioned books. Um, some of the material there actually is actually in the data governance book, so if you want to uh, look at it again or in a little more detail, uh, do so. Uh, and they have a nice session coming up at EDW at the end of April in Austin. So today we're going to talk about uh, the role of uh, principles. This is an area where you hear a lot of things uh, about, um, uh, but there seems to be lack, uh, obviously, here. Well, we need principles. Um, I don't think a lot of people understand how important principles are the foundation of a good data governance or information management program. Another area we're going to cover is that there is a distinct difference between principles and policies and you want to try to maintain that uh, separation. We'll look at some examples, and lastly, we'll take a very brief look at the approach used to develop principles. This is an education session. This is an introduction. Uh, full on education will be at EDW, but this will give you a good general idea. We will be leaving time for questions at the end, so if you do have questions, please uh, uh, do so. I am um, prepared to answer many of the uh, quite yet around this topic, uh, but please, anything you want to ask, please do so. The rules of principles. Uh, the best way to look at an information or a data principle is to take a look at a similar example, and I would call that something like a, a, a religious canon, a commandment, or uh, the Bill of Rights, the first ten amendments to the United States Constitution. Um, these lay out foundational philosophy for society or a belief system. And I know it sounds a little bit high-handed, but that's what you need to do around information principles. What there are a lot of people are absolutely listening to this webinar is because you'd like to manage your information as an asset. You therefore aren't really doing it now, at least in your point of view. Well, the first and foremost, you need to adopt some philosophy that says your information is an asset and will be managed as such. 
And that is not just a trivial metaphor. That belief system that in turn for the foundation of corporate or organizational behavior. There's a lot of books out on the business non-IT side about principle-centered management and principle-centered leadership, and et cetera, et cetera. Um, those are a coincidence to what I'm talking about here today. That's how important information and data principles are. These become everyday guidance. When an organization follows a data principle, it means you have internalized and accepted that philosophy that data is an asset for example, you're going to treat it. If you say, we're going to go ahead and embark upon our data uh, uh, thing without um, uh, any type of, um, um, uh, we were, well, we're just going to say, everyone, here's some policies, uh, uh, listen to the data governance stuff, and then uh, we're going to take it from there. You're going to actually find yourself less likely success because psychologically, you haven't moved the organization. And it sounds a bit, um, again, I wrap up on this slide a little bit lofty for an information person or a technical person to be talking like this. This is really a psychological uh, weapon or tactic or technique to get your organization uh, moved in the direction of managing information. Policy principle and codify desired behavior. Some say, I want to treat information as an asset. Fine. The policy says how you go about doing that. It or data issues are built around data quality or master data management. You have policies that support new behaviors to improve data quality, new behaviors to go for that golden copy of the truth that you're seeking. But there are policies. But in the policies, you have to have that philosophy. A lot of organizations will write policies and have 20, 30, 40, 50 policies. All right, and they'll just crank up policies like crazy. Well, could be effective, but they're less likely to be effective because there isn't any education uh, or foundation in them. Um, there's a that was drawn for me years ago, uh, my first book, and it's two people facing each other. The background is this huge bookshelf, and it's like standards. And, and the, the tagline is, of course, we believe in standards. Look how many we have. And organizations are like that with policies. When we go in and do a data governance program or EIM program and to build out the principles and policies, we, of course, look for policies that already exist. And in in every organization we go to, we will find scores of policies that have been written, diligently published, diligently distributed, and absolutely totally ignored and not enforced. Usually because there's no acceptance of the philosophy behind that policy. Right? So um, processes built into quality and, and those things are are policies. When you create a process, you're saying everyone does this process. Well, when you apply a behavior, that, that policy. Uh, another one that we uh, really think is significant is, is integrating your data policies with your systems development processes, whether you're waterfall or iterative or agile or some blend of all of them. Um, it's important to have policies that support a disciplined development and use of data and information. And that, of course, will then affect the procedures of developing your systems and your scorecards and things like that. Uh, several flavors of policies. Uh, one that we talk about all the time and don't really accept that as a policy or as codification of philosophy, and that's the data standard. A lot of organizations say, here's our standard. Well, what's being that? Put yourself in the shoes of a business person or some in app dev, and your data people come trolling down the hall and throw the book on the desk and say, here are our data standards now. World, would they listen to those or adhere to those if that's the only way you go about it? 
I mean, would say, okay, thank you very much, and then politely move it off to the side because I have work to do. There has to be that philosophy behind it. There has to be that back backup, all right? So the standards, data model standards. Uh, in addition to that, now we're getting the semantic standards, so adopting an industry uh, taxonomy or an industry ontology. Those are important adoption of policies, and those have to be grounded in some philosophy or principle for their use. Controls. Now, this is a policy that's widely accepted in many organizations, especially financial service, and that is a, and, and curls, again, are a type of policy, right? So we want to make sure that we have X rows of data from this uh, particular application and X rows of data that go into the next application, or we process 2 million euro of items here, and the other system has to also produce that 2 million euro of things, and we want to balance that. Um, or reserves have to be a certain amount of level controls. Those are uh, standards uh, and types of policies. And if you violate those, there's a problem, there's an interruption, there is a feedback, okay? Um, that's the other thing that is difficult with policies. Uh, someone writes a policy, and uh, you get to the section where we say, what are the consequences of not adhering to the policy? And they say, well, we can't do that. We, we, we're we just going to call the guideline now because we don't want to get into trouble. Or management says you can't set rules and hold people accountable. Or that means HR needs to be involved. Or there's a labor union involved for some reason. And all the teeth comes out of the policy. Well, then it's no longer a policy. Don't call it a policy. It's a guideline, it's a recommendation, and it's also a waste of ink and paper because nobody's going to obey it. Um, it goes back again, uh, before I move to the next slide, to sum up what these principles mean. They really do mean changing behavior. They really do mean altering how your organization thinks about information. It's not, yes, it would be wonderful if we had a golden copy and everything would be would happen if we had great, clear quality for analytics and we can answer all of our questions and not argue about the answer or not, that would be wonderful too. But what we've missed over the years is the fact that organizations don't think that way about doing their jobs and we have to change that mindset. That's principle is for. for. A recap what we've talked about, here's a little taxonomy for policies right here and you have the principle with its ordinate policies Policies are made up of, of standards. We're talking about such as data standards or data model standards, or using a certain ontology or taxonomy. We have controls, which can be financial controls, regulatory controls, compliance type of controls, and then all the other processes, such as processes from a development life cycle. Um, a classic example of a principle uh, begetting a policy that's a process standard or process policy. Is we're buying the data as an asset. Okay, fine. That's the principle. The policy is while we're developing new applications, that has to be considered from the beginning. So that means you alter your development cycle or your methodology to consider data at the beginning or the charter phase or the initiation phase or the ideation phase. And you work with data all along the way. Normally, most organizations can get to the end and say, well, now what should we do about the data? And, and so you see where, you know, mindsets have to change, behaviors have to change here. And, and, and we all say this, we all wish it would happen in, in the, the thousands of engagements and the thousands of people I talk to. And, and they say, well, how do I get my organization to change? This is one of the core drivers for that, is really understand that principles and policies are very, very, very important. So let's look at some uh, 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 library, a very brief library of principles. Uh, when I was writing the data governance book, I was gathering all these basic principles that I was seeing in organizations and was going to present them. And I realized that there was a pattern to them. Not a lot of common, even though they were worded differently, they had a cool meaning that was the same. And because we really want to treat information like we treat any other asset, I came to the conclusion that maybe we should be bold enough 
to propose some generally accepted information principles. Those of you with a financial background might have heard of GAAP, generally accepted accounting principles. Those are a set of standards. They're not law, they're not code, but they're standards that no accountant or financial person on the planet would violate because without them, accounting doesn't work. We need something similar uh, in our uh, information world. We need some type of canon that uh, applies to that. So here are 10 higher order principles that can be used to form the foundation of yours. And uh, we built this presentation today to leave enough time to go over these. Um, first one is the content as asset principle. And we hear this all the time that information is an asset, data is an asset. Uh, this will broaden that. All enterprise content, structured, unstructured, rows and columns, documents, images, recordings, all of that is an asset. Well, if you're going to say that, they have to be managed, secured, and accounted for as those other assets we've been talking about for hundreds and thousands of years. So this is the the uh, the foundational at, uh, principle. It's a principle gate that's for real value. <clears throat> and there is value in all of the data and content. Now, the value can come from the contribution objectives. And now I said business and operational objectives. It's saying as part of a policy and principle that innovation is valuable because we're going to make better decisions and our reports are going to agree not what I'm talking about. That is not a statement of real value. What I'm saying is if our information is good and treated as an asset, we're going to retain customers and make more money. Real quantifiable income statement or balance sheet appearing objectives. Also is the marketability of data and in the 21st century here more and more and more organizations are treating it as a fungible item or a commodity. And a contribution to goodwill, which is your balance sheet valuation. And there are actually accounting opinions on that. If you feel uh, like um, it's a really boring cold evening, in the Financial Accounting Standards Board's opinions under Google, and you will see valuation equations for data and information. This foundational principle here says, look, your content has value, and it's not just metaphorical value. Even if it's on the balance sheet, yes, it's that type of value. Next point concern. Now, going concern is also a gap. It's an accounting principle. And what it means is that when we look at a business, we look at it as of today, and it and it will be out of business tomorrow. We assume that is a life, a forever life to the organization until told otherwise. Now, same with data. Approximately the last four decades, data and information has been a lubricant for applications. It makes applications run. Data is something application A can send over to application B so it can work. What we're saying with this principle is forget that. That is primitive, all right? It's a means to achieve a result or a byproduct. But this debt and information is critical to the operation and management of the business and needs to be treated much better than treating it now because you're not a going concern with treating the data the right way. And if you want to understand the input of that, just look at the financial crisis of 2008. Look at the pieces of it and you're going to see poorly treated data everywhere you look. look. Next, do um, a due diligence is a legal term that means if you have an action that should be taken to ensure a positive result, you need to take that action. Uh, and when we apply it to information, we talk about risk. If risk is known, it must be reported. If risk is possible, it must be confirmed. There's an obligation to risk and data. Some of you out there might be looking at each other, and some of you might be winking at each other because you've done a data quality project. We have uncovered an absolute cesspool of data quality. Someone has said we can't tell the boss that the data is that bad. This principle saves you because this principle says you're obligated to tell somebody about that. That's an important principle. Let's talk about quality. 
Uh, we're talking about quality of content or information. Relevance, meaning, accuracy, and life cycle. So we kind of put a lot of concepts into one principle here. Update content can affect your financial status. In other words, we're not going to tolerate bad data. Um, some of you might be in an organization that says, okay, well, we don't have time to fix it. It's not our thing. We're, we're a hard-charging business organization that just gets things done. And by golly, we're just going to clean it up at the end. Or we'll get up someday. This principle invalidates that approach. All right. What you're seeing here is sorry, this is really important stuff. We're not going to let you consciously create bad data with the philosophy of cleaning it up. We work with several organizations in the last few years where massive data cleanup efforts, cleanup systems, uh, cleanup departments, have become accepted practices. They're on their third generation of people working here. And creating vast spreadsheets to do find and fix items have become accepted business practices and have built into budgets and things. And now it's, it's done it that way. For the reason it was done in the first place was to create a band-aid for a data problem. Well, you know, it might be uh, the right thing to keep doing that for some reason, for costs or, or, or other reasons. But um, I find it very surprising that what has be, that was a an exception to the rule has now become um, unification and standardization in many organizations. Audit. Uh, this basically says that if you're going to be serious about your data, you're going to let someone check it out. And whatever conclusion they come with, that's okay. If they say, well, it's still pretty lousy, well, okay, accept that and try to fix it. One is risk, and that's with a little bit to the due diligence. But this takes it up further. There is risk associated with content. Um, it has to be recognized either as a liability or through costs or some activity to reduce that risk. But it says is that content can create risk for the organization. We don't overlook that anymore. And I'm going to address it. Again, this supports uh, when uh, organizations are deliberately and consciously saying, we're going to fix it at the end. Um, um, we're going to tolerate that and live with that. That means that they're failing to recognize the risk of that uh, behavior. Accountability, um, uh, a very unusual word. In, uh, the IT world uh, for many decades, and that is uh, holding people accountable for uh, uh, poor uh, work with data. And this principle says, well, we're going to do that. So if someone can lose, in, in the ultimate instantiation, is someone can lose their job over bad data. And for those of you that are struggling in organizations and, and having uh, integrated data and poor data left and right, uh, which would sometimes wonder. Uh, that that would never happen. But that's what this principle says. We had one joke, person joke once that if we adopted that principle, there'd be nobody left to work here. So um, I hope it's not that bad where uh, you are. The last one is liability. And it means that those risks and information uh, can form a liability. And you need to understand that someone can misuse your data. Um, and it would be an ethical misuse or a regulatory misuse. And if you I uh, have been following the news uh, in the United States about some department chains and some uh, uh, mass hacks. Um, you are seeing what the liability uh, uh, principle is all about. Um, you, uh, and that, that's just the tip of the iceberg. There's lots of other liabilities buried in your data. It needs to be recognized. So there's some core principles. Now, your principles will come from these. And, and principles and organizations tend to be a little bit simpler, not as wordy, but as I said, those are a higher order canon around information. So the common seeds we see are a lot of information is an asset. Information should be representative. You know, in other words, it, it, it speaks the truth or it has authority, accurate, currently um, we be able to share. Some to see the word collaborate with information. Obviously, secure and secure can cover privacy and, and, and regulatory security. Um, eligible, and that cover we can use it. We understand that we know where it is. Uh, that's a principle that covers metadata. Uh, it should be cataloged. And there's another principle that would come metadata in a repository or something. 
something. To think about with your principal, whether it's the higher you, you implement a very high order burn like I first showed you or something simple and short and sweet to the point, is this a goal and can you implement it? And something that you cannot implement or your organization cannot possibly culturally tolerate, they need to try to think of a different wording for that. But here is a list of common ones. If you just Google uh, on the Internet, you'll find uh, uh, hundreds of examples of other principles. Example of one, um, a particular organization wanted to really emphasize customer because they were very, very customer-centric. They had two really critical critical subject areas, customer and item. Um, both of them had their own principle. They'd be in a single authoritative source for customer data. Um, now, there's two things that go with the principle when you write one. And if you just don't write the principle and say, here we go, you need to talk uh, in a disciplined fashion about the rationale behind that. Why are you doing this? Why is that? This, why is this particular phrase or choice of words important enough to, to make a principle, to, to basically go to change the behavior or, or, or the culture of your organization or its belief system. You need to come up with a handful of reasons. In this particular organization, we're going into a customer-centric organization because the market had changed. Uh, there was many, many new market pressures. Um, the cus customers were getting information from the organization and it wasn't matching. Um, uh, there's the concept of the single view. A lot of times you'll hear 360 degree view of a customer. Um, there were tremendous costs with maintaining redundant data. Uh, those of you that are uh, struggling to do some type of master data management solution, um, uh, recently I found if you take a really good look at the cost of your redundant Products or item files or customer files, uh, you can get management to raise an eyebrow. Um, when you really, really take a look at the real cost of all of that, it's a scary number. Um, a single clearly identified source of data will lose latency, so it, it's faster to get to things. So this is a type of rationale, and this is really important to have. We'll, we'll see why in a minute. Um, uh, the implications uh, even more uh, important. <clears throat> uh, uh, now the rationale, and you kind of play pretend, and you say, well, if this really, if we spell this out, and let everybody, we're going to have this single authoritative source of customer, uh, what does that mean? Well, it's going to mean we're going to have some new business rules. We're going to have to capture data once and only once. We're going to have to have a single source. In our organization, some organizations, you won't have a single source. It might just be just a designated place of truth, but it could be multiple sources, right? Clear points of capture and controls and mechanisms and et cetera. I'm not going to read all of that to in the interest of time here. But we have here are a lot of uh, mechanical things that have to happen and, and have to be in place. And these are really important that you go through this exercise and talk about these. And if you have two pages of these, fine, because this is where your policies come from. Uh, uh, many years ago, we were doing an engagement where someone said, how do I know what policies I need? And we're early on into this, and we'll be honest to say, well, we just kind of know wasn't good enough. This particular organization had a very unusual business model. Um, and the standard policies just weren't enough. So we get creative. Um, and what we did was we took a look at the rationale and, more importantly, the implications. We said, what? How do we deal with the implications? And what we figured out was once we came up with a policy or a statement to deal with every implication, in other words, if we have to have business rules, what's the policy to have those? If we're going to have a single source, do we need a policy to enforce that? And found from looking at all the implications that those write something to it, the implication created an abstract for a policy, and then we're able to take those and reframe and blend them and create policies from the implications. Then we bounce them back up against the rest. And then I'll back up a slide here to see that those policies support the business rationale. So if I have a policy that says you will only 
enter the data here and only here, and it'll have this these rules on it. Does that will that make the rationale happen? That we'll be able to handle the costs that we're going to have a clearly identified source. Well, we'll be able to address those market pressures. Now, this gives you a mechanism or, or a technique versus just made a creative exercise. We can put some due diligence on your um, on your policies here. Please remember our processes and standards based on your principles. You review the implications section for your. So once again, you go through your implications. Uh, come up some statement that addresses every single one. Reflows down into statements of codified behavior that they are supportive of the rationale. And every principle would have at least one policy, but a uh, or more policies. There are policies that will be written once in a while that will have more than one principle they are supportive of, so that's okay as well. I'm going to go through a little a process here uh, to do that, and we are going to do that as soon as I take a sip of water, and then we will do so. Thank you for me. <clears throat> Tommy, I had cold here. So first, um, there's actors that drive. Uh, you know, I showed you the list of uh, high order principles that gives an example C principles, and then I showed you just kind of how one would look uh, very in a bit compact format. But uh, to get to that point, you need to consider your environment. One business need. Well, we had an organization that had a, a lot of market pressures related to customers. So obviously, we're, we're looking at our organization saying, we're an organization that needs to respond to customer problems. So I think some principles around our customer data are going to be required here. Or, or we're going to have some policies that are anchored in some principle whose channel is supportive of our business needs. Some organization uh, that, uh, for example, is uh, uh, dependent on operational response, and uh, um, uh, is a big example. You're going to want to have a principle that's supportive, uh, that lays the foundation for policies, supportive of low latency and, and high turnaround and high responsiveness. So you can get uh, a version of the going concern um, principle, and there you're going to have some application, some, uh, I'm sorry, some uh, implications that create some policies related to responsiveness. And then from there, you're going to have some policies that say, when you do information systems, they're going to be built around responsiveness and service layers or something like that. So you can see how you need to sit and take a, a, an effort to plug this uh, to get, again, we have a five-minute-plus questions event here. We're going to go into this a bit more deeply in Austin. Uh, also, your organization's maturity. Uh, you're not – if you have an organization that is highly decentralized, fragmented, or is culturally um, uh, incapable of a type of discipline at all, um, and have no information discipline at all, you're not going to go anywhere with a bull that says we're going to super customer data. Uh, because all the implications there are things that you can't really do. So you're going to need to back up, find a principle that says, or go with the, go with one of the higher order principle that says we're going to treat information as an asset. Um, and uh, that means uh, um, uh, a true asset as such. And then you might want to bring in some of the risk the principles or the asset type, type principles. So you're going to say, we're going to start to consider and account those principles will start to change your maturity. The policy could be very, very primitive and very focused on just particular point solutions. So maturity is very important. Lastly, your culture, you know, culture is different from maturity. Right? Culture is how your 
organizations gets things done. You can be an immature data company, a very mature data company, have a, have a very fragmented, uh, uh, independent culture, a very centralized culture, or have a rigorous culture, and you can have combinations of all of those. You know, in kind of a, a try to matrix in, in in your head there. So you need to consider that because when you, when when you, you put in a principle and you want to to codify behavior, your culture will resist it. Any change to a culture will be resisted. It doesn't matter how, how re, your culture is the most receptive culture in the world or not. Change, change is change. You need to accept that. So you just need to consider how that change is going to occur as you're developing your principles. Now the other steps are we, of course, we apply those higher order principles. And by the way, I love to evolve those. What you're looking at with the gate are my interpretation. Um, and while I was writing a book, so um, uh, you might have a better idea. And, and please email me. My email uh, is uh, in this presentation, and or you can get a uh, home through data diversity uh, with perhaps another suggestion. Uh, several people suggest to merge the risk and do these principles in some way, shape, or form, and replace that with a um, FC or single source or golden copy type uh, principle. So. Um, uh, please uh, feel free to to uh, suggest uh, uh, something. Um, we apply the higher order principles. Then we take the seed principles. So the higher order ones might be really cool and awesome, but we look at which someone might say, "Wow, that's what John did," but that's just just died, and we can't use that. And so you do something a more uh, appropriate for your organization. Again, you're applying your culture, your business needs, and your your here. Once you do those, you want to refine those principles because the first time you do a list, you're going to have too many. I have a rule of thumb. No more than 10 principles for any organization, no matter how big or how small. Lives, we will start with one principle because an organization's culture can only handle one message change in a philosophy at a time. Um, but we they're doing an enterprise wide and saying, let's drive a stake in the ground and here's all of our principles. Uh, we really work hard to get them under 10. You know, uh, there's an old uh, scene from from an old movie, an old Mel Brooks movie called History of the World Part One, where he is portraying Moses coming down off the mountain with the commandments and has tablets in his hands. And he says, Behold, I have 15 commandments. And he drops this one. And he says, Behold, I have 10 commandments. All right. Um, that's kind of where I'm going with here. You know, 15 is too many, it's too much to carry. All right. It's a better number. I'm talking about philosophy here. No one's going to want that different philosophy. Um, then you complete your principles by adding the rationale and the implications, and it's really important to do these. You know, really think about hard. I'm sorry. Really think hard about um, why you're doing this particular principle and what it means, uh, and what are the implications. And now go back to our three little bubbles on the left there. Okay, what are uh, called impacts? What are are we mature enough to do this? Do we need to to alter this, or do we say, well, here's ten principles. Mm, through ten are, are way advanced for us. We're never going to get there if we start with them. Let's hold those back for, for a while. All right. Of course, the business needs. If we see that our marketplace is demanding that we have uh, um, for example. A profound operational um, uh, ex uh, integrity and, and flexibility, and we don't have a principle that supports that, well, then back to the drawing board. You're going to need to have one there. Um, uh, in fact, that's been a suggestion of one of the gates is that information management is directly connected and tied and supported above business goals. It's, I don't want to make that into a philosophy, however. Any ideas again? Just send me a note. Sitting here, um, principles are an essential building block 
any type of data governance program. Uh, you're, you, you, when you do data governance, you've got three big chunks of stuff. One, you build out the organization, that is, how you operate data governance. I use the word organization, and that's a misnomer. Uh, a lot of people use it. I, I don't like it. Um, I'd rather call that an operating framework. But um, it, it's how you do it. Uh, the next important component is the business alignment of that, was you've got to be doing something for the business. Um, and, you know, doing data governance so we have better data so our reports are more accurate is not sustainable, which is the third adding, you know, how do you make it last? And that's some of the culture change things we've talked about in other talks and things like that. Um, Facially, to the, especially to the operating part, are the principles and uh, the policies. You can do, you can set out roles and responsibilities. So, you know, here's my stewards, and here's my custodians, and here's my owners, and all of that. And they're going to do these things. Here's what a steward does, and here's what a custodian does, and all that. But if you don't have that philosophy behind them, you, and rationale that goes with it, and the implications, and therefore the policies, and oh, by the way, I can measure policies, I, I can measure adherence to policies. So if you don't have principles and good policies, you can't measure the effectiveness of the organization, well, then that plays into the business alignment because now I can't prove to the business that the investment in governance is paid off or not or is paying off and not sustainable because I don't have a lot of the data I need for my metrics. And I'm able to change, to make some type of cultural adjustment or some behavior adjustment, and I don't have a philosophy behind it. You can see where this is a very, very important aspect of of data governance uh, program. Um, we are moving along well here, so I think we're ready for some questions. Uh, Anna, I'll uh, open it up, and I think we have a few coming through, and uh, you can read those or any others that you're getting, and we'll have a nice, juicy Q&A session here. Sounds good. And one of the questions that always comes up, of course, is if people will receive uh, links to the slides and the recording. And I will be sending out both within the next two business days uh, to all the registrants, so you'll be sure to get those. So go ahead and type your questions in the Q section in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. And we've got a question coming in. Uh, John, is there a particular maturity model you would recommend in assessing our organization's maturity? There are many maturity models. Um, I, uh, uh, we had that slide handy. Um, but um, uh, I pull it up, but now it'll be a little bit of um, just not do that because uh, then that'll make up time from the other questions. Uh, let me uh, uh, phrase it this way. Um, the traditional type of maturity model where someone says there's an initial stage and then you go through repeatable and refinement type things, those are connected to the old CMM that came up uh, the software industry in the 1990s. Um, uh, people will use that, but that's a process model, and it's difficult to map to an information model. There are other similar ones where you can say that you are um, – Active to things and proactive to things, and those are okay. They fit your culture fine. Uh, some that are just bold what you're capable of with information, and you know, some organizations can just do reporting or what we call uh, what did you do yesterday level of maturity, um, all the way to a um, uh, an ontology or taxonomy type thing, which is you know we can uh, we have context. And we can figure out what we did and analyze what we did contextually, um, and uh, then perhaps a very, very um, um, uh, knowledge model where uh, we're going to predict what we're going to do tomorrow, or we're going to predict what might happen tomorrow using analytics. So, you know, it's a machine model of what you can do. Uh, That's a really good one, too. I would say uh, any one of those that's talked about are very effective because it gives you a good uh, qualitative measure 
instrument. There's one, however, that I'm beginning to really uh, adopt, and that is an education uh, or a capabilities model. Um, and it's a simple four steps. Um, and those steps are, are uh, wrote, understand, apply, an organization around information, if it has a rote level of understanding, it knows and people will walk around saying information is important, but we do something about that. All right? Understanding um, is when people say, I've got to do something about that, and I'm going to do something about that. I'm going to make sure that I sponsor a data quality program or, or the CIO says we're going to do some type of master data thing or something like that. And recently we had an organization where the CEO said, enough is enough. Just somebody please start to show me miles so I can count belly buttons. All right. Um, so that understanding. Next is an application. And that, we're seeing that a lot of organizations have a master data management solution. Um, a data governance program going into place, uh, sophisticated analytics, uh, it's like that. Uh, the question thing happens though when people automatically be in their job with this ability that data is important, that it's an asset. So when something, when a new effort starts, immediately the thinking is let's care of our data. They correlate the effort or the new challenge or the new business opportunity with how am I going to take care of the information? And that's one I like. It's simple. It's four steps. It's based on educational theory. And a lot of people understand that. So what I just talked about in combination with a couple others would be uh, what I meant. Another question? In is, what are your top tips to convince senior management of the importance of data governance information management? Well, and, and, and information is changing over the time. A few years ago, it would be, uh, don't you want to be competitive? Um, 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 understand how much this is really costing you, and that kind of. Because you know, senior management doesn't really become motivated until it's you know more customers, more profit, lower cost, better products. Right? Very, very simple decision there. And by the way, that's as it should be. I'm not arguing with it all. Um, more, more recently, as more and more companies get on the bandwagon with this, um, and, and I see things like a, a health reform here in the United States, things like that, I'm, I, I want to scream, you can't do this, but don't you want to survive? It's getting uh, uh, to think about here. So my top tips for, for management are understand your business needs. Is your business trying to dominate its market with good products or with agility? Does this need to more, be more flexible and responsive? Are you having trouble retaining customers? Do you want to retain more customers? Do you want to grow? Do you want to grow by mergers? These are all things you can find in your annual report or in strategic documents somewhere. And you need to tie those activities to and the concepts of governance and information management. You have to show that, well, you want to have more customers. Well, you need to be able to count the customers you have. Oh, you can't count the customers you have. In fact, you go ask three vice presidents for three counts, you'll get three different customer counts. And by the way, that's silly. Oh, by the way, this is what it's costing you to get the incorrect answers. We need to know what the correct answer is. Because without that correct answer, you're not going to be able to retain and increase your customer base. It can't happen. And even if it did happen, you wouldn't know it. So an explicit connection of what information management and governance does to business needs. And again, I have to emphasize this again and again and again. When I see a project for do master data or big data or whatever, and I see more data as the business objectives, right? Or our reports don't agree with us as the business objective. I get afraid because the company doesn't understand the act and the they have not accommodated the cultural change that information is an asset. They might be saying they 
to but haven't, because those are the wrong objectives. Jeff just should be saying, we to manage our data really well so we can increase our customer base to X percent. So we have X percent more sales. So those are the objectives I want to see. Then I'll the company starting to get it. So make that tie. Make that tie between what those things do. There's in my both my books several examples of strategy maps. Uh, again, send me an email. Happy to send you one. Something like you'll start to see how, how you can make that direct connection. And years ago, people say you can't do that. Information is too abstract. It's too abstract. That's a bunch of you can, can do it, and uh, we do it all the time. And um, uh, that's some that's the important driver right, right there. That's my favorite topic, as you can tell. Next question. Good one. Uh, for organization with very few comprehensive of policies, how do you gauge how many principles your organization should attempt to start out with from one up to ten scale? Um, if very few comprehensive policies, the first thing I would do is one, is anyone listening to the policies at all? You're comprehensive, but is it comprehensive because of the scope of the policy or is it comprehensive because lots of people follow the policy? It's comprehensive because lots of people follow it that look for that principle, if it existed, would be the foundational principle of that policy. I'd start with that one. I'd kind of reverse engineer it, okay? If you have a lot of comprehensive policies in scope, but not many people are paying attention to them, I'd say forget them, okay? So we'll, bring in, we'll bring them back in later when somebody notices. Uh, start with you know start with the old standby. Information is an asset. We're going to treat it as such. What are the implications of all of that? That's the one I would start with with everybody. Okay, um, that's kind of the Uber principle. That's the overlying principle that everybody needs needs. To, the, 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 it's an asset, but we don't mean it as a metaphor. We mean it as a true driver, cultural and philosophical, and that's the one. And again. Any more than 10 principles, that's too many. You've got too many statements to fall on. My guess is, is uh, clients say, we'd love to send you, we were working on our principles, and we think we're done. We're going to send you all 25 of them for a review. I so said, happy to review it, but I'm going to tell you right now, there's a 15 policies in there that you think are principles. And when we do the applications and the rationale, we always find out that they've actually taken a policy and raised it to a, a statement of philosophy. That's okay. I mean, that's what the refinement process is for. You, you, know, I, I, you know, imagine the, if you're familiar with the United States Constitution, our Bill of Rights, those first ten amendments, really set a philosophical tone that has, that has operated the United States for well over 200 years. I mean, the Bill of Rights would have had 60 amendments in it. The founding fathers would, first of all, not been taken very seriously. And the Supreme Court would be busy reinterpreting all of the conflicts between them. Keep them simple and keep them dead there. So, on, you know, scale of 1 to 10, start with 1 for sure, and then uh, uh, that's it. Question here? Oh, yeah, we've loads of questions coming up here. <laughs> we may run out of time. Um, the next one is from uh, one of our uh, uh, regular webinar attendees. So, yeah, there was a question to go back and just, Jenny, let me know if you want to, there's a different slide that you wanted to view. Um, how exactly does one get management to listen long enough without their eyes glazing over to afford one the opportunity and overhead to begin reporting the cesspool of data quality existing in the organization? Repeat that one. There was a, a hiccup in the circuit there. Repeat that one again. Absolutely. How exactly does one get management to listen long enough without their eyes glazing over to afford one the opportunity and overhead to begin reporting the cesspool of data quality existing in the organization? Uh, proactively do a data quality exercise, profile a certain set of data, show together the numbers of what it's really costing in the way of missed opportunity. And show information, uh, show management, anything but that. Do, um, information people, and boy, I'm guilty of it back in the old days. We're so proud of our data. We're so proud of our of our, of our um, concepts and, and, and models and, and the way we can abstract and understand things and that, we, that we just think our management wants to hear all of that. 
and put their eyes glaze over. Uh, do not show a management and data model ever. 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 Right. Do not say that information is uh, an asset in the abstract or initial comment. No, start with we have a problem. We have data is like this. It is costing us this much. We lost a contract last year from a major client. We are not competitive. Uh, it costs us. Um, you know, we've got clients where, where they've made where there's been mistakes from data quality of millions of dollars in reruns of products and things. We have a problem here. That problem is labeled as data quality. The solution is manage our data better. There's a lot of things that go around that. We'll get later. But now understand that this is a problem that we need to address. Stop there. That show them the numbers and go there. If someone says, if there's another thing where someone says, we don't have time, the boys go back. We got projects to do. Um, uh, you know, don't 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 do this. This is where I I um, this is a due diligence thing. If you know there's a problem and you know it's costing your organization money, my philosophy is you, if you're a professional, you don't have to ask. Just the time, do it, put it in, and take it. There. All right. I mean, you wouldn't if you want walking from, your, from the plug of the car and saw a big tank leaking, you would report the leak in the tank, all right? You would report the bad data. Same thing. So um, uh, uh, that's the thing. Tell management about the problem and tell them that there is a solution and ask for permission to go from there. Fantastic. The question is, where can we find any reference material on GAIP? Only reference material are is what I have there in um, uh, the slides in the book. Um, I explained one of those in detail in the book and kind of how they uh, came about. Um, uh, I would like to write a at least small book or an exhaustive white paper on them uh, sometime in the next year or so. But that's all I, I got. All right. Have and which specific? I have sleep sometime, kids, okay? Um, <laughs> now, it, it's in the government's book. Okay. It gets a link to the to John's book, so you have access to that. And, uh, of course, both are available in the Dataversity Bookstore. Um, another question? Uh, oh, so this is a follow-up to the uh, previous question. Uh, additional management has the tendency to believe Purchase release of new tools without culture change is the uh, panacea for all data quality ills. How do you advise management a fool with a tool is still a tool without losing your job? Well, um, you just uh, uh, if look if management says buy this and you say well diligence again diligence says we don't know what you're gonna you're gonna you know we're gonna buy us this. Uh, you know, table saw with laser cut and everything else, and and uh, but we don't know how to use it, and we don't have any wood yet. Uh, uh, and they go ahead and buy it anyway. You know what? Don't say no. If you really like your job, don't say no. Just don't use the tool. All right, set it aside. I, and you're not the first person to have an organization that has a tool nobody uses. Trust me on that one. All right. But if you have any say in it, just say we can't buy tools are for productivity. We don't know where our productivity needs are. Let us try this one way. We can where we need it to apply a tool, and then we'll apply the, the tool. There's, there, there's, it's not, you know, um, there's tools that you can go ahead and get. The fact everybody that's they can have a data quality tool, pretty much. And those of you that are really getting into elaborate data governance should start to really think about something to manage your policies and your workflows and things like that. But other than that, uh, you know, just don't buy anything. And if they make you buy it, don't use it. And then update your resume. Then um, there's one here I'd like to take a crack at before we run out of time. What additional hurdles do global enterprises prize have when developing principles that are relevant across geographic and culturally diverse groups? This is also applicable to even a syncation. Federation is a real big part of your business environment. I just sell you those three bubbles. 
how you better your principles is important. That's why that rationale is so important. If you have a problem that is, uh, we're working with a client now that is everywhere. We're in their 39 countries, and they're a very complicated business model, and 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 six strategic business units. It's it, you know what you know business unit has its own set of principles, but we based we had to come up with two to everybody. One was information is an asset, right? And we have to treat it as such. And the other one was uh, based on risk. You know, information can contain risk. And we are also going to, to uh, put the policy in place to, uh, to to understand and manage the risk and the information. This is something we could apply to everybody. The rest of them, because each business unit might have a slightly different culture, slightly different level of maturity, uh, things like that they they have with their kind of own federated or sub principles. It's not just one that we had that kind of, kind of layers of principles there, international organizations. But that's you can easily apply that to a an organization that has you know just two or three lines of business in one one country. So there you go. This is fantastic. I'm afraid that's all we have time for today. For And, John, again, thanks for this great presentation and Q&A. It's a, a very good insight, in the, and I look forward to the full presentation at EDW. And just to remind everyone, we will be posting the recording of this webinar and slides to dataversity.net within two business days. And I will send out a follow-up email to let you know the links and other requested information. And don't forget to register for Enterprise Data World in Austin, Texas this year by January 31st to take advantage of the best prices available. Thanks again for all the great questions. I just love it when everyone's so involved and for your time today. And thanks. I hope everyone has a great day. Thanks. Thanks, thanks John.